Audience targeting is the most important part of any campaign. Of course, we can argue about that, but the best way to ensure you're getting your message in front of the right people is by getting laser focused on your audience. And with all the data and tools we have available to us today, the options for targeting are infinite. So how do you know what works best for your campaign, what to avoid, and all that stuff? In today's episode of DGU, Mark and I will focus on all the tools, data, and approaches that we've used to get in front of the right people with our content. Demand Gen U is officially in session. Let's do it. So Jason, we're, I think this is our 60th episode that we've recorded, and we knew that there was going to be a time where we had to double up on an episode topic. I believe, I think I'm the Demand Gen U historian, this is the first time that we've doubled up on an episode topic, but it was also our first episode that we ever recorded. So there's so much that changed in a year and a half that I think it's probably fine to double up on this topic. Yeah, and we didn't go back and even look at the outline or didn't go like re-listen to that episode. So this could be an exact cop. No, I'm just kidding. It won't be. It's like, we know it's been a year at least, and we know we've made a lot of changes in some of the stuff that we've done from a targeting perspective. And I think since last year, targeting is probably even more important than it was last year around this time. And so, yeah, I think it's a good topic for us to replicate. So... Before we get into really the meat of this episode, let's just talk about targeting in general, because I think prior to metadata, I fell into this camp. And I think it's a camp that many people who listen are familiar with because they might be living in that camp right now. And it's how they came up with who they were targeting. So what I would do is I would try to figure out, usually in a silo, what I thought the firmographic criteria were for the people that we should be targeting, usually in the shape of industry company size with employees, because revenue data usually is not available, location, and then layer on some job titles and call it a day. So that was one part. And then the other part is, you know, hey, here's a list of accounts. Sometimes I came up with that list of accounts from a marketing perspective without much, I'd say, research behind it, but more of wouldn't it be nice to have these accounts as customers? And then oftentimes, which were the more unrealistic accounts, were the list that sales gave me of, hey, these are mammoth whales that we'd like to land. Wouldn't it be cool to have some crazy logo on your site and call it a day? And that was really the extent of my targeting. So how do you think of targeting in general? Well, no, and that's a lot of us, especially we're just in the ad platforms, we just stick to whatever they have available. And that's actually improved somewhat over time. You see LinkedIn adding some different targeting capabilities. And like then you see Facebook, saying, oh, we have business targeting now. It's like, you've got people and where they say they work, which nobody really keeps updated on Facebook. But so most of us, that's where we cut our teeth on targeting. And I think a lot of people assume that the ad channels are going to have what you need. Like, oh, well, it's the ad channel. It's where I'm trying to run ads. So of course, they're going to have what I need. And so you just stay in the channel and what their, their targeting capabilities in the channel. And you don't really ever realize that, oh, wait, I can create my own lists and then I can upload those into the channel and then I can add even more stuff on top of it. Or there's just a lot of other things that you can do. And then once you realize that, then you're, then the options become like really open. So yeah, most of us start with the stuff available in the channels, industries. And then we're left to like trying to, especially for B2B, we're left to like, well, is this industry mostly B2B? Is it, and we don't even really know. It's, it's like a, and I remember There were no checks and balances for me doing that. I would just go through a list of industries that were sounded like B2B and they're like, oh, uh, papers and recyclables. Like, I don't know if I'm actually classy or not. Like, yeah, yeah, it's like (laughs) railroad. Like, I'm like, yeah, like, yeah, those are the ones that I'm thinking. This is the exact ones that I'm thinking of right now because I've done that before. Zoology. I'm just like, there's seriously, so it's the most random industries available. And yeah, and the reality is most of those industries are a mix of B2B and B2C. And so then if, if you're just, and if we're completely honest with ourselves, the ad channels don't really have a reason to help you get more narrowly targeted because then it's less money that you're spending, right? Because if I can really narrow down to like just the people that want it, that I would have relevance to what I'm saying, that's less money I have to spend. And then less, that's less money getting into the ad channels. So they're also playing a little bit of a shell game with us at the same time of like, well, let's not open it up too much, which is honestly like the LinkedIn piece that I hate the most is how they've normalized all their job titles now, 
Well, people might think that's helpful. It's not. It's actually detrimental to all of us marketers because now if I put in some niche job title, LinkedIn, let's just say it looks like it's a content marketing manager. It's probably going to take that and just bucket it with marketing manager. And then all of a sudden, now I'm like, I can't even target the people I want. And LinkedIn has now made it more broad. So yeah, they're don't, I think, yeah, I'm just thinking of this right now. Don't rely on the channel like to help you with targeting because they're going to benefit from you going way bigger than what you really need. So you got to take it into your own hands. And speaking of taking it into your own hands, we just launched a PLG product that can help you do this. So that was the first ad read that we actually never got paid for because it's our own podcast. But yeah, you can do this with MetaBatch now. So that felt good. Exactly. Yep. So now. All right. <laughs> Back to the regularly scheduled programming. So <laughs> I think as we were talking about this, there is just so much scrutiny on marketing spend right now. And that can come in more ways than it probably should, but that's not what this episode topic is about. And I think one of the easiest ways to eliminate wasted ad spend is just to get better at your targeting. So walk me through that and you know what other VPs of marketing are probably struggling with when it comes to that in the current economy. Yeah. So a year ago, we'll just go back to like last time we talked about this. A year ago, the targeting wasn't as important because a lot of us had, I had three times as much ad spend per month as I do now. And so when you have all that money and it's growth at all costs, let me actually make my, make my list broader because what you're, you're, what you're kind of optimizing to at that point is I just want to touch every single person that could possibly have a need for my product, even if I'm polluting or just like broadening out and touching a bunch of other people with less relevance. Because again, some of these decisions you're making in targeting you're going to leave some people out just on accident and you're going to include some people that you don't want to include. Well, it, it didn't really matter. And in fact, we aired towards just larger audiences a year ago because it was like, hey, yep, there's some probably people in zoology that are like a B2B company. And so let's throw zoology in there. I don't even know. That's not even an industry. That's a goddamn like discipline. But anyway, um, and so it was just less important. But now the like, budgets are tighter. We'd rather err on the other side, which is, okay, I, if an audience is mixed, I probably want to cut it out and save the money and really focus on the ones where, especially if I'm just using industry, where that industry is like almost all B2B and I pretty much know, or there's some other qualifier I can put on there, another filter I can put on there to really get to B2B. So yeah, it's just, and again, like we mentioned in the beginning, there's really no other way to improve the impact of your campaigns than through who you're targeting it to. Because it's, yeah, it's like, I, I'm not in the market for women's pants, let's just say right now. And so if I were to get ads, for that would just be wasted money on me. And so really getting targeted and okay, these are the people that are, and we'll talk about what kind of stuff to use outside of just industry and things. But that's when you get into, okay, it's not just industry, because that's like thousands of accounts. But now who in there is actually searching for a solution or who in there has a problem that there, there's some flag I can find that they're like, hey, I've got this problem that you might be able to solve. Small correction, just to keep you honest. So I went into LinkedIn Campaign Manager right now. There are two different ways that you can target zoos. The first one is museums, historical sites, and zoos. And then the second one is zoos and botanical gardens. So you tell me if those are B2B or B2C. I don't know. That first one, yeah, huh? I don't know. Go some <laughs> All right, so we got that out of the way. And then I kind of mentioned what my world used to look like when I first started at Metadata and building targeting lists and then what life like what life was like before metadata and how I went about it. So what are some of the standard ways that you've built targeting criteria and lists in the past? Yeah. So yeah, like really the ways we've been talking about starting with industry, layering on things like company size, either from number of employees or annual revenue, layering on the job title just so we're right at the right person. And you know, oftentimes we'll have maybe several job titles that we want to speak to. And so that's one way of just start with the broad audience. And then here's one for my CMOs. Here's one for the CFOs. Here's one for the marketing doers or however you want to split up your audience in terms of who you want to talk to and how you want to talk to them. And then LinkedIn has given us things in the past, like 
starting to add things like, are they on these like lists of, for example, like the Inc. 5000 list or are they, do they get these kinds of awards? And so there's some things like you can start to use like that, but so there's that. And then there's the other way of, and this gets a little bit more scientific. Okay, let's take our existing customers. Let's split them out. And this, of course, you can only really use once you have a decent number of customers, but all right, let's take these customers. Let's split them out. Let's do some analysis on, all right, let's take out the ones that maybe churned or that not have a good health score. Let's focus on the ones with the high health score that have renewed. And let's just tear those down. Let's just do some analysis on it and see, is there an industry that pops here? Is there a certain employee or revenue band that pops? Then you start to ideally map that against some other signals too. And you can see, are they hiring? Are they laying people off? Are they, what kind of behavior is going on around it? Those are getting a little bit more advanced, but that can help create a list. And then shit, even something just, hey, let's go into our database and just go with everyone who's at a, Closed loss opportunity. You know what I mean? You're just basically creating segments in your own database and like just uploading lists into the channels and you're starting to target that way too. So yeah, that's the more, then I guess the last one is you're coming up with an ABM list. Like when you're, if you want to run an ABM play um, and that can be done in all sorts of ways. We'll talk about it, like externalizing a bunch of data and then using that to create the list. But sometimes it's like sales. If you're very sales led, they'll often have an opinion themselves. Like, hey, no, these are my target oh, accounts. Salespeople having an opinion? <laughs> what? Yeah, surprise, surprise. And some oftentimes, like I've worked at a couple of places where our targeting really started from sales. It was like, hey, and the sales reps said, hey, we've done all of our own analysis. You know what I mean? And here's what we've come up with. And then sometimes you just take that list and you're like, okay, I'm going to trust you. And especially if like you're saying you want leads from these accounts and if I deliver these, you're going to be happy. Cool. That might be an easy way to start as well. And all the channels allow you to upload at the very minimum list of accounts and match those and then layer on like job titles and things like that. So that was a lot of stuff, but those are more of the basic ways, obviously, to target. I mean, when I was at Uptake and we had, I think we were working in probably five or six different international geos. I could, couldn't tell you anything about the quality of the lists in geos that weren't the US and even North America in general. I was just taking all of the regional sales leads word at, yeah, these are the accounts that we should be targeting. And I just took it. Like I, I didn't know how to target internationally. And in hindsight, that was horrible because we wasted a lot of spend. And I don't think we really generated much pipeline from any of those lists. Well, yeah. And that was a filter. I just complete like a very basic filter. I just completely left out. Yeah. Geography often. Yeah. And it's because we're pretty much really focused in North America, but most of the times, international, like multinational companies, you'll have a specific budget and performance KPIs that are specific to a geography. And so you'll want to split your campaigns by that oftentimes. And so usually you like start with a big audience type and then you just create sub audiences of those. OK, here's my ICP. Here it is in North America. Here it is in Western Europe. Here it is in China or wherever else. So, yeah, that's another very basic one. Most often that's like company headquarters location. And so that's what you're really keying off of, not like the leads or the pro like the employees specific location. Yep. Yeah. And I've gotten burned like that too. So I'm going to jog your memory here for a little bit. You remember the big old Google sheet that we had when it was a marketing team of two, the thing that used to crash my computer sometimes because it was so big when I opened it. Yep. Love that. So let's get into how we were going about creating our account list at the end of the day. And yes, we were using our own product, but also there were ways that we needed to try to get a little bit more creative with finding unique data points to build that list. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is where like you start externalizing the data and creating your own little database. And this is, you're usually at an account level for this one. You're not getting down to a person level or a job title level, but this is at an account level, just trying to figure out like what accounts should we target if we're going to move into an ABM approach or externalize our targeting from these platforms so that we can add more data to it. And this, you know, we'll give some very prescriptive instructions here too. The first thing I'll say is almost all, because a lot of people get hung up like, well, I got to merge all these different data sources together. That can be a nightmare. Yep, it can be a nightmare if you're trying to merge on company name, but because everyone writes it might might write a company name differently. I think technically we're Metadata Inc. 
but we never write that. You know what I mean? I would never write metadata com Inc. if I was like filling out a company thing. So company names are hard to match on. And so that's where people sometimes get hung up. They're like, well, I have to externalize all these data sources then match on company name. Then I got to take out all the weird words and spaces. And so I'm just left with the key name. And it's like, no, you don't. Almost every source of data that I've used has company domain as a field of data. And that is very normalized. You know what I mean? It's something.com, something whatever. And so that's the key value. You're, the company has a domain and you're keying off of that. That can get sometimes a little bit wonky if you got like a really, really big company that has like several different divisions and shit like that. But we'll leave that out for now. So yeah, so domain. And so what we started to do is I was like, well, we have all these different data sources in our own targeting platform. Let me start by externalizing that data. So I would go in and we have Bombora, for example, or G2 Intent. And I would just go into Meta Match, create a, the broadest audience possible of just like Bombora, this topic, no other qualifiers on it at all. Just what are every, what's every possible company that has intent for this topic? And of course, Meta Match wants to spit out rows of people like job titles. And so I limited it to just give me one per company. You know what I mean? Because all I really needed is the domain. Um, and I externalized that. I did a little bit of work on it. So I just get, here's everything from Bombora that they say all the companies that are in market for this. Here is, and then I did this for a bunch of different data sources. Here's what G2 says. If we do a technographic audience on one of the ABM platforms, like Sixth Sense, here's what, you know, here's, and they all spit out a list of domains. And so I would take that. We would start by just the basic Zoom Info information that we'd get from every company. So we use some Zoom Info credits. Then we just started to basically do VLOOKUPs of all this data in Google Sheets and just like VLOOKUP using that domain. And we would just do indicators like yes or no, right? Because intent is like, you're, you're, it's on or off. And so if we found a match, it was a yes. We ended up with this big, massive spreadsheet. That was, I, I actually pulled it up right now. I'm staring okay. at it. Nice. But yeah, so um, I'll feed you some softballs if you forget anything. Well, we did some interesting things too, because like we'd have three different intent data sources, right? So we'd have like, here's Bombora intent, Slintel intent, G2 intent, for example. And so... One of the things is like, yeah, I'd like to know if they have any of these, but also I want to know if they like a specific intent, but do they have intent in any of these things? And that became a new field that we would create. We normalize things like uh, number of employees and annual revenue, if we had that. And then by externalizing the data, you also get to see like, oh, there's a bunch of companies that we're, we don't have revenue data, for example. Well, in targeting platforms, you don't see that, so you don't know who you're missing out on. But now at least you're like, oh, there's a bunch of these that don't have it. Well, maybe I'll include them too, just because they're unknown. So I can go these revenue bands or null, you know what I mean? And now I've got, oh, okay, that adds to my list. And so there's things you can do there. I'm trying to think what other data sources we use. Let me see if I can remember without you jogging my memory. I know there's one I'm leaving out right now because I'm going to get well, to Well, as you're thinking, just so everyone else who's listening knows, I asked Jason while we were prepping for this, is there anything that you don't want to share or feel comfortable sharing with how we built our targeting? And he said no. So like you are getting an inside look at how we do this. And it's not to say that you can copy this, you know, in the same exact way, because it probably won't make sense for your business, but you'll hopefully get some ideas as to the types of unique data that you can use to build your list. Yeah, absolutely. And I challenge everybody because I'm going to talk about this next in a second. So right now I'm talking about all this data. I don't know what we use built with data. We use that. Like I'm talking about sources that a lot of people still know about. Where it gets really interesting is if you can find your own, create your own signal data. Uh, and so we started our first foray into this was counting ads and just getting a count of ads that these companies had on LinkedIn and on Facebook. And I can't remember who showed me, but somebody at some point showed me like, hey, you can look at all the ads a company has loaded up on LinkedIn and Facebook. It's really easy. You just go to, in LinkedIn, you just go to their posts from their company page posts. And once you're in posts, there's another filter for ads. And then LinkedIn, you just can scroll through and just see all the ads. Now, well, hold on. It's way easier now. It's like front and center. But before, like when we were doing this, it was available. You just had to work a little bit to find it. Now That's you just true. go to the company page and it's like right there. Yeah, yeah. And actually on Facebook, it was even weirder. You go to Facebook page and you go to like privacy or something. You know what I mean? It's like it's, it's, you follow yeah. this interesting other path. But yeah, yeah, yeah. 
both of them, you end up on a screen that you just scroll through the ads. And so I, at a previous job, I'd worked with this team in Poland to scrape company data off of LinkedIn and create our own company database. And so I was thinking, I was like, huh, wouldn't it be great? Because, you know, a better target for us are not just every B2B company, because that's, you know, what we can say, but it's like, B2B companies that are spending money on LinkedIn and Facebook on these ad platforms. And so, and there's no data available that I know about. If anybody hears this and knows, let me know. That can give you like an estimated amount of LinkedIn spend or Facebook spend by company. It just does. These are walled gardens with memberships, you know, that people are highly targeted. And so I think that's why it's hard to scrape like Google search. It, it, if it exists, we will handsomely reward you if you yes, listen please. and you tell us this. Yes, we'll bring you on, we'll bring you on an episode um, <laughs> to talk all about it. And there's some wonkiness in this ad count because like what LinkedIn doesn't show you is which ads are active in a campaign or not. So there's a bunch of ads that are loaded up there. You'll count that'll be like not even active or old, but I felt like this is a good proxy. And so... We basically came up with and we just count ads and the system would just scroll through and just count, 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 and then just add it to the database. And so we not only use that to determine who would be, you know, again, surface really wanted to laser and get to a target account list, but not just that, but then also the difference between the number of ads they had on LinkedIn and the ones they had on Facebook, because a big part of our play is, hey, do business advertising on Facebook better than you ever have before. And so we could go to them and message people very specifically, like, why do you only have 73% of your ads on? You know, I mean, we had like very distinct value props based on, I remember this, based on ad counts in one channel versus the other, yep. if they weren't advertising at all. And I think we grouped it into three different segments with specific value props that we had. Yeah. Yep. hundred percent. And so sometimes this data you collect, you actually can use it to personalize your outreach as well, or personalize the campaigns you're running to them. And we did a lot of that too. So yeah, that was really, once we got to that point in the spreadsheet, that's about where it ended, I think. So that's, it got, it became a beast to manage. And then I had to pay the team in Poland, I can't remember, it was like $3,000 every time they reran this. And that was happening every quarter. And so it was like getting out of date pretty quickly. So I was like, okay. And then a couple of times we messed up and corrupted the entire database because we did a V lookup wrong. And once it got, you get two more moves after that. And you're just like, the spreadsheet's just dead. And so it just, and then like you said, it could crash. There were just like so much data and so many so V the V lookups, here's actually another piece of advice. You can't leave the V lookups in place. So once you do the V lookup, then you have to copy and just paste the values because Google Sheets is trying to run that V lookup all the time for every field. And so if you leave them in, the sheet just gets, it never works. And so you got to do the V lookup and then you just copy and paste the values right back in there so that they're now static values. So that's another little trick because this spreadsheet, like, there were 20 some thousand accounts, I think, on there. Uh, right? 20, a, a shade under 29,000 rows. And then for columns, it's probably, I would say, 50, eh, maybe 60, 75 columns. <laughs> and a lot of those are VLOOKUPs against a much bigger almost database that's sitting in another sheet that has all the ad counts and stuff. So yeah, it's, yeah, it gets to be a beast of a sheet. Yeah, and we, then to bring up a funny story now, but it was horrible in the moment. Then we were sharing it with our small little sales team that we had then, and they're looking in it to figure out how they're going to start reaching out to accounts. They don't know how delicate this thing is. And then people are filtering, they're hiding, they're about ready to break it. And I just remember whenever their face would pop up in the Google sheet, they're like, don't fuck this thing up. There is so much behind the scenes that goes into this that you don't know about. Yeah. Yeah, there was actually Salesforce data in there because now you said that. I remember we actually also pulled in the account owner from sales so they could filter themselves and like, oh. I mean, it was, listen, it is a, it's a, it's a work to be beholden. You know what I mean? Like, it's a nice, like, it's a, it's a, it's an analyst, you know, like, I won't say. It's an analyst dream to like, just have all the data available, but, yeah, it quickly became unscalable. So perfect segue into the next part, which is how we've evolved our targeting. Where did you first start once you realized that the sheet was just out of control? Like, I know we're going to start to talk through a couple of different data sources and tools that we've started to use, but when did that light bulb moment go on? I think it was probably right after Brittany started and I was like, okay, phew, I don't have to do this fucking thing anymore. <laughs> Let me hand it over to Brittany. 
But honestly, we took a couple steps back. So when we stopped, so we stopped updating it. And then at some point, Brittany was like, was using those that audience for a while. And then it started to become stale because we hadn't updated it in probably three months. And so then she basically, rever- I don't want to say reverted back, but she really started to focus a lot more on retargeting audiences and that kind of thing at that point. And then just trying to leverage more of the native kind of targeting capabilities and our meta match targeting. And we stopped, we stopped it for a while, but then about, I don't know, nine, 10, nine months ago, 10 months ago, I saw that our buddy Adam Schoenfeld had started a stealth company. I heard it in my network. I was like, oh yeah, he's doing account scoring. And if anybody knows Pure Signal, um, they've been tracking and like collecting data on B2B SaaS companies for several years now. And it's data that it's very rich. It's very updated. It is, it's got data points in there you can't find anywhere else. And it's very comprehensive. Again, it's, I think it's only B2B SaaS. So like, you got to have that as one of your high, like targeting industries. But if it is, then it's a really good set of data. And they actually expand beyond B2B SaaS, but their core model and the places where they have really unique data is really around B2B SaaS. And so I met with Adam and just understood more about what they were doing. And I was like, oh, okay. You already have a lot of the signals that we're trying, that we're just going and getting manually already. So like we see eye to eye, but you actually have a way of bringing all those signals together and then putting them into some like an algorithm and weighting the different things to, to actually come out with an account rank and account score. And then being that we were like customer number four, Adam earmuffs, Adam didn't quite know how to price yet. And so we got a pretty, pretty smoking deal i think on on using them and so yeah we've been using that we got nine months now we grandfathered into that or did he realize uh well we're not grandfathered in so i get in the next (laughs) (laughs) i'll be true hopefully being an early customer will get some love and we're shouting them out on this podcast so hey there you go adam i want want a shout out discount (laughs) that's amazing and how long have we been using Key Play? Because this is when Brittany started at Metadata about, what, 14, 13, 14 months ago. Yeah. This is when I took myself out of the equation and started doing other stuff. So a lot of this will be new to me, but I'll keep asking you questions. Yeah, no, about nine months now we've been using Key Play. Now, what's interesting for us, now Key Play wants to start like almost any other scoring platform, which is let's analyze your current and your best customers and your worst customers. And then let's at least have a sense of what that looks like and model it off of that. But for us, we always knew, at least in the in our own analysis, we were like, there's no real good way for us to tell with any of this data we have available, if someone's going to be a good fit for us or not. We had, and the reason why was because At first, we thought maybe it's the amount of spend they put through the platform every month. That should be a good indicator. The more they're spending, the more likely they should be to renew. And so renewals was really for us, like that's the the key indicator for a a company to model after. So we're like, yeah, certainly like the more they spend, or maybe there's something else, like maybe it's how many employees they have, or so we have these hypotheses. But when we went and we did the analysis, there was literally nothing we could tell in this normal data, even if like number of ads, firmograph, like just the normal firmographic data, even things like money raises, all these things, we couldn't find anything that would like easily separate the best from the worst customers. And we knew that going in because we were thinking ours is really tied to ad spend. And again, there's no, there's no good data source for that, but also, and then as we started entering this recession, we realized Even if they're spending a ton of money now, there's no saying that they're going to spend that next month or that they're going to have that same budget a quarter from now. This is when everybody's budget started to get tight and pulled back and everybody started to like. And so we that's one of our and it's still to today. One of our biggest challenges in our own account scoring is we can't we can't predict when a company is going to have their marketing budgets cut. And. If anybody can, again, that's another, get on the phone with me. If you can help, if you can predict when somebody's going to have their marketing budget cut. Tell tell us, yes. (laughs) Yeah, we need to know that. We've had, and you know this, we've had deals in commit for us that are like, for us, if the deal is in commit stage, 
That's like the rep saying, if this doesn't in blood, you can have in my blood. Yeah. They're basically like, you get my personality that doesn't close. And so we were having deals in commit that last minute, like day before signing, they're like, oh my God, my CFO just cut my budget by 50%. I can no longer buy this. And I had no zero warning that was going to happen. And so it just became more difficult. And so that's still a challenge we have is, is because most of our platform is so tied to ad spend, when that goes away, we tend to go away with it. And so that's still one of our challenges. But we've added a lot of data to our modeling with KeyPlay that kind of helps us get around that. So things that they've been adding recently. So they added the LinkedIn ad counts for us, which is nice. That's been a great, that's been a more recent, but will be a great improvement to our score. They're going to add the Facebook ad count next. But they've added things like marketing department size. You know what I mean? And that's not easy to get in other ways. And then not just that, but then the change to the marketing department size. And often, especially in times like these, the change in the data is more important than what it is today. And so, oh, that's going up or it's going down. So now we have a sense which companies are hiring and which companies are making layoffs right now. And we actually will pivot our messaging because we'll target both, but we have different messaging for that, you know? And so we'll use that data to help pivot that and target that. And then just things like number of job openings or what are they hiring for? Or there's other things like that we can start to use in the key play model that help us. And we've been using that and refining it. But yeah, that's where we're at today with just key play. And there's other things that we're doing too. So let's get into some of the other things and give some more shout outs. So user gems is something that I know that we've been using. And I feel like I see them a lot on LinkedIn and people talking about them. Let me see how well I know this. User gems basically tries to identify previous champions that you used to work with after they've changed jobs and gone on elsewhere? Yep, exactly. So how are we using that outside of the obvious? Yeah, user gems, you can spit out a report. So it can just give you a report of all the people that are changing jobs or the companies that have had changes in jobs that are your customers. And so we just waited, we just had to wait till that list got big enough for us to create an audience from it. And so we just basically took it, uploaded it into MetaMatch and created an audience from it. In fact, no, we're doing a dynamic audience. So it goes into Salesforce first and then MetaMatch sits on top of that. And then it updates that audience every day as people come into and out of um, user gems. But yeah, that's been a great source because and user gems we use internally too. Like the AEs can use it themselves. Just, oh, here's my account. They just left. I can go message them now at this new account. But I think that multi-touch approach where it's like, oh, let's make them see some ads too. And the ads are relevant. Like, I don't know what they say, but like, hey, bring metadata with you, or I don't know, something that just kind of alludes to the fact that we know that they've recently had a new job or something like that, and remind them about the, the value they got from metadata when they were a customer. And so yeah, that's been great. And I think we've had user gems in-house for a while, but I think the audiences just got to a point, like a large enough point, so we can use them in advertising. So I think we just started that like a month or two ago. Nice. And then another one that I know that we've been playing around with, I forget for how long, but Mad Kudu. So I guess one, walk me through what Mad Kudu is, because I feel like I know, but I also don't really know. And then now we're using it. Yeah, it's very similar to Key Play, but it's all the way down to the lead level. And so now it's not just at the account, but now it's using all these signals to determine, okay, and it'll have some account signals and that'll add to the score, but then it'll have some lead signals too, both based on title, but also behaviors. And so now you can basically start to leverage, oh, are these people on your website more? And you end up with a lead getting a grade or a, and a score. And so then the reps, they can basically sort by this Mad Kudu score and see which people at their accounts are actually showing more intent or like maybe have a higher score. But what we're really looking forward to Mad Kudu to do for us is more help us understand like product led, product quality, sorry, product qualified leads. And just basically using more of like our free trial and product led behavior to kind of score leads and surface the people that are using it a lot, that are using a lot of it and might be ripe for more of an annual kind of a commitment or whatever that might be. That's really where we want to take Mad Kudu because we like key play for our account scoring. If anything, we might just feed the key play account data into Mad Kudu for the account score and then let Mad Kudu really bang on the people side of it. And so that's how we'll use Mad Kudu. Um, we're not quite there yet. We have a first model out there, but it doesn't 
it doesn't match key play. And so we want to make sure there's a little more tie there. So, and this is where I don't really know any of this. So asking for a friend, AKA me, like what's the lift on us to make this all work between key play and mad kudu? Is this, it sounds very time intensive no? but yeah, the, the, the vendors are doing a lot of the work for us. So like with key play today, we do the scoring externalized. So there's not like an integration directly to Salesforce. So They'll just, we'll just dump our whole Salesforce database. They'll score it and then we just bring it back in. Oh, they'll score it and add signals to it. That's the nice thing about Key Play too, is it's not just the score, but any of the signals that we want, like their LinkedIn ad count, we want that actual number. They can just basically put that back in the spreadsheet and then we upload it. And Sam, our RevOps leader, handles all that. So it is a little bit more manual. So we're doing rescoring maybe once a month, something like that with Key Play. I'll look forward to the when the data is a little bit more refreshed, but, uh, was your original question was the difference between the two? Now I can't remember. No, just it, it sounds pretty sophisticated. Oh, just being yeah. straight up. And I didn't know how much like we're doing ourselves versus how much they're doing, but it's pretty cool. This is all news to me. So this is, this is unusual, but there's too much going on from a marketing perspective at Metadata to truly know everything. Yep. Madkudu, the platform is pretty interesting because, but it gets very scientific. So like Madkudu is, you kind of need to understand like, some statistics and like nodes to really be a good user of it. And we're not quite, I don't even, I'm like, I'm not, I've probably not qualified to use Mad Kudu. So you have, cause you, it gives you all this data and it gives you a way to build your models, but it's pretty complicated, at least in my mind. And I know we get help from our CSMs there, but I don't know if that's, does everybody get that kind of help? Is that just us? And you need a data scientist to run it, but there's, yeah, there's some, I remember Mazo walking me through and I was like, I don't understand what's going on here. This looks like a, yeah, like a data scientist dashboard or something, but. I'm looking at their website right now and they've got Guillaume's face on one of their pages. So I know if it's good enough for Guillaume, it's probably one good and two, too complicated for me. <laughs> uh, that, guy's, that guy's brain is out of, it's just out of this world. It's insane. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. I learned a lot. I hope. Everyone who's listening learned a lot too. I think the beauty of all of this is the first half of the episode, we really just talked about how we were using a spreadsheet to come up with who we're going to target. Granted, we had access to data sources, but you don't need a, a whole lot of crazy tech to do this. Now we've graduated on to using more tech, but everybody's got to start somewhere and 29,000 row spreadsheet is where we started. So <laughs> you can do the same. Yep. It's, I love targeting. It's like one of my favorite topics because it, it still can be pretty mired in data and I still really like working with data. So yeah, I like this. I, I, I couldn't tell based on this episode. So I'm glad we doubled, doubled up on this. And thanks to everyone who listened. This was a good one and I'm excited to see how this one will land. I think it will, but we will see. Cool. Uh, we'll see everybody next week on DGU. Yep. Thanks for listening, everybody.